Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat datang ke program uh, webinar CPC. Jadi bersama kita pada hari ini adalah Jabatan Oftalmologi dengan uh, tajuk CPC When a Cataract is Not Just a Cataract. Jadi dengan tanpa membuang masa, saya menjemput chairperson kita pada hari ini, Profesor Madya Dr. Jemaima Cik Hamzah untuk meneruskan acara. Dipersilakan. Assalamualaikum and a good afternoon to everyone. On behalf Tengah, of... Prof. No, uh, ada ni eh? Ada di rumah? Suara tak dengar. Suara tak dengar? Terjauh sangat saya. Suara tak dengar. Okey, boleh tak? Dengar tak? Boleh dengar kan? Ah, Prof. Raizak kata boleh dengar. <laughs> Okey. <laughs> Okay, Assalamualaikum uh, and good, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Ophthalmology, I would like to thank everyone who is with us in the CPC webinar. Nampak gaya, uh, it's about 4.40 at this moment. So, um, uh, thank you for uh, uh, dropping, me, uh, dro dropping in uh, for, the, uh, for the webinar, the CPC, CPC webinar Department of Ophthalmology. So this time, uh, instead we are presenting systemic disease with ocular manifestation as the initial presentation. We will pre be presenting a pure ophthalmology uh, condition. Uh, I think this is important as, as we are an aging society and the age pyramid has changed from top heavy to bottom heavy. So we are seeing more of elderly patients presenting with uh, blurring of vision. One of the commonest uh, uh, symptom in ophthalmology. So in this webinar title, when a cataract is not, we should likely to be diagnosed a cataract by the community, but in fact, it is much more. Uh, so here we, uh, we are fortunate to have our panelists, three young budding would be ophthalmologists discussing about the case. Uh, at the end of the session, we will have your uh, question and answer session. And please uh, put your question in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, not the chat box, Q&A box. Okay. Um, the first presenter uh, will be uh, Dr. Mushida uh, Hassan Basri, a th third year postgraduate student, uh, previously working in Hospital Klang, now currently in UKM followed by Dr. Kwan, Tan Kwan Zi, who is also, also a third year postgraduate uh, post student who worked in Hospital Shah Alam. And then the case discussion will be uh, by Dr. Shahira Ami Hamza, who is our registrar and will be joining the UKM fraternity soon. Okay, be, without further ado, I call upon Dr. Mushida to present the case. Your stage, Dr. Mushida. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'll be, I'll start the, I'll start uh, this presentation uh, with the case history. So the history is a 73 years old Malay man with history of uh, type two diabetes mellitus. Uh, he's he came with complaint of pro progressive left eye blurring of vision for one year. So the history of present illness, uh, the blurring of vision is generalized and is progressively worsening. He went to optical shop to change his glasses. However, there is no improvement. And the blurring of, the blurring of vision is associated with one month history of left eye restricted field, uh, where he only noticed when he closed his right eye. So for the history, uh, there is no eye redness, no eye pain, no halos uh, to indicate uh, acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, there is also no headache, no nausea, no vomiting. 
or no blurring of vision worsening in dim light room or at dusk, uh, also to suggest acute angle closure glaucoma. He also denied any distortion of central image, uh, which, which is suggestive of uh, macular pathology. And there is no history of unilateral numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, uh, which suggests uh, intracranial uh, pathology, uh, such as face occupying lesion. And there is no history of loss of weight, no loss of appetite, and there is no history of trauma. So for past ocular history, uh, he's using multifocal glasses uh, since the age of 50 years old. Uh, he denies any history of uh, surgery to the eye, and he did not have any previous uh, eye screening for diabetic retinopathy before. So for past medical history, he was diagnosed to have type 2 diabetes mellitus since August last year. At that time, he presented to the health clinic with fever and noted that the random blood sugar was 18. So currently, he's on oral hypoglycemic agent. However, he's not that compliant to his medication. Otherwise, there is no other systemic disease such as hypertension, uh, ischemic heart disease, uh, stroke or asthma. So for, there is no past surgical history. For family history, there is no family history of glaucoma or blindness. For drug and allergy history, he denied uh, any self-prescribed steroid or traditional medication, and there is no known drug or food allergy. For social history, he's married and blessed with four children. He denied uh, alcohol consumption or smoking. So on examination, uh, he's alert, conscious, and comfortable. His vital signs, the BP was 168 over 87, slightly high. He is uh, not known to have any hypertension before. Uh, pulse rate is 72 with retrospective of 7.5. So this is the uh, examination of the eye. Uh, this is the right eye, and the photo shows the anterior segment photo of the right eye. Uh, the vision for this right eye is 612 with pinhole uh, 69. Uh, the relative afferent pupillary defect is negative for the right eye. Uh, sorry, there is no uh, conjunctiva photo here because it's a zoom in photo, but the conjunctiva is white. The cornea is clear. There is no Krukenberg spindle sign seen here, uh, which is a uh, pigment pigment uh, deposits uh, on the endothelium or the inner aspect of the cornea. Uh, the anterior chamber is deep and there is no uh, anterior chamber activity seen. The iris is uh, round, the pupil is round and reactive. Uh, however, there is presence of pseudo exfoliative materials on the pupillary margin. So if you can see here, there is a whitish um, like a dandruff uh, deposits uh, seen on the pupillary margin. And usually it is uh, easy to be seen uh, under sleep lamp examination. His uh, intraocular pressure is 18, normal. And the lens um, is a cataractus, a nucleus sclerosis cataract of grade one. So for the left eye, uh, the vision is 612 uh, with pinhole 69. Uh, there is positive uh, RAPD for left eye. The conjunctiva is white, the cornea is clear, and no Krokenberg spindle sign seen on the cornea. Uh, the anterior chamber is deep and quiet. Uh, on the iris, we see a similar uh, pseudo exfoliative material also on the uh, pupillary margin, this white um, uh, dandruff like deposits on the pupillary margin. And uh, for left eye, the Intraocular pressure was high, which is 54 millimeter mercury, and the lens is a uh, nucleus sclerosis cataract of uh, grade two, and there is also phacodenesis seen. So this uh, next slide, um, I want to show um, how does the left eye phacodenesis uh, seen. So when the patient moves his left eye, the the cataractus lens. Uh, is shaking or mobile, and uh, it is usually best viewed when the pupil is dilated. So I play the video again, just for you to have a look again. So as you can see, the lens, uh, look on the lens, so it's, it's actually uh, shaking when the patient is move, moves his eye. Okay, so then we, uh, since the uh, intraocular pressure is high, 
So we proceed with a gonioscopy examination. So for gonioscopy, we use a gonioscopy lens uh, at the slit lamp to look at the angle of the eye. So basically to look at the uh, angle between the cornea and the iris. So uh, this is a, a photo for the right eye angle, which shows open angle. So we can see the structures between the uh, in the angle, uh, which is the iris root, sclerospur, and the trabecular meshwork, as well as the Schwabi line. But for the left eye, uh, we couldn't appreciate the structure because it is a close angle. So left eye has a close uh, angle. Okay, then we proceed to the fundus uh, eye examination. So this uh, this is a photo for right eye and left eye fundus uh, ex, uh, fundus photo. So for right eye, the media is clear. The optics is pink with a cup to this ratio of 0 0.3. Uh, if you look at the below photo over the right eye, uh, you can see that there is a presence uh, of uh, silver wiring at the retinal artery, which indicates a uh, hypertensive retinopathy changes of grade two. Okay, for the left eye, uh, the media is clear. The optic disc appears uh, pale, uh, or palish uh, compared to the right eye. And then the cup to this ratio is 0.8. So it's a big cup to this ratio. And uh, there is also uh, changes uh, at the artery, um, silver wiring, uh, which indicates hypertensive retinopathy. So if you look at, uh, this, is, uh, this is the disc. And the area here is the neuroretinal ring. So this is where we call the disc. Um, Sorry, the first one is a cup. So this is the disc. So the uh, inulation uh, cup to this is uh, 0 0.3 compared to the other eye where you can see the uh, neuroretinal ring is actually thin. And there's, a, uh, there's an uh, inferior notching down here with the bionating, which is a sharp bending of the vessel coming out from the optic disc. Uh, so this shows that the cup to this ratio is uh, abnormal, which is 0.8. Uh, compared to the right eye. And there is also a uh, peripapillary atrophy uh, seen in both eyes, and it, this uh, usually associated with findings in glaucoma. So in summary, this is a 73-year-old Malay male. He presented with one-year history of left eye generalization associated with one month history of restricted visual field. Examination showed left eye best corrected visual acuity of 6.9 with positive RAPD. Intraocular pressure was 54 millimeter mercury with evidence of close angle on gonioscopy. Pseudo exfoliative materials were seen on the pupillary margin uh, associated with mild cataractous lamp with phacodenesis. Left eye fundus showed glaucomatous optic nerve head and right eye examination for the pseudo exfoliative material on the pupillary margin. Uh, otherwise, both eyes should grade to hypertensive retinopathy changes. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Nursi. Um, okay, well, we'll go to the second uh, presenter, which is Dr. Tan Kwan Zee. Uh, Dr. Kwan Tan Kwan Zee will uh, present on the, the diagnosis investigation. Thank you. Uh, if, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer, sorry, question and answer uh, box down there. Don't use the chat for question and answer. Boleh, boleh teruskan. Um, in this case, our professional diagnosis is a left eye anchor closure glaucoma secondary to subluxated lens with the underlying pseudo exfoliation syndrome and the right eye pseudo exfoliation syndrome. Our differential diagnosis are left eye acute primary anchor closure glaucoma 
left eye plateau iris syndrome, and left eye pigmentary glaucoma. For the discussion on the diagnosis, our professional diagnosis is the left eye ankle glodial glaucoma secondary to the sublaxated lens. On the discussion on the diagnosis, uh, our professional diagnosis is the left eye ankle closure glaucoma secondary to the subluxated lens with the underlying pseudo exfoliation syndrome and the right eye pseudo exfoliation syndrome. The supporting point for this diagnosis include age. Pseudo exfoliation syndrome is more common in the old age group with which fits into our case. For the unilaterality in this case, only one eye involved in the ankle closure glaucoma. This points toward the diagnosis of the secondary glaucoma. And the presence of the pseudo exfoliation material with the phagodonesis, this point toward the presence of the salazetan lens. There is also an asymmetrical anterior chamber ankle and the anterior chamber depth on the fellow eye, whereby the right eye has an open anterior chamber ankle and deep anterior chamber and the left eye has a closed anterior chamber ankle and a shallow anterior chamber. This points toward the, play, the presence of the subluxated lens on the left eye. Other supporting points include the presence of the glaucomatous optic disc with the raised intraocular pressure. However, the points against this diagnosis is, the, is the patient has, this patient has no sign of ankle glodial glaucoma, such as eye pain, redness, headache, nausea, and vomiting. Um, the first differential diagnosis uh, is the left eye acute primary ankle closure glaucoma. Primary ankle closure glaucoma is a primary glaucoma in which the closure of the anterior chamber ankle leads to the aqueous outflow obstruction and raise in the intraocular pressure. As you can see that this picture is show an acute presentation of the primary ankle closure glaucoma you can see the, there is a mild haziness over the cornea and there is a mid, uh, fixed and mixed dilated pupil and the shallow anterior chamber. The supporting point for this diagnosis include age. The primary ankle closure glaucoma is more common in the old age patient, which fit into our case. Based on the clinical findings, this patient has ankle closure glaucoma with the closed ankle on the gonioscopy, shallow anterior chamber, raised intraocular pressure, and the glaucomatous optic disc. However, the presence of the uh, pseudo-exfoliative material on the, papillar on the papillary margins points toward the pseudo-exfoliation syndrome, and the positive family history is one of the risk factors for the primary ankle glodial glaucoma. However, this patient has no family history of glaucoma. And usually, primary ankle glodial glaucoma involves both eyes, but in this case, it's only involved one eye. The second differential diagnosis is the left eye plateau iris syndrome. As you can see, the first picture, uh, this is the cornea and this is the iris. The uh, anterior chamber ankle is situated between the cornea and also the iris. And this is a normal picture where, whereby it shows the open anterior chamber ankle. And the aqueous humor from the anterior chamber will flow uh, will, will drain into the trabecular match work to, to exit the eye. The second picture shows that it's a presence of the plateau iris due to the anterior insertion of the iris. This will result in the narrow ankle and cause the obstruction to the aqueous outflow and cause the increase in the intraocular pressure. So the supporting point for this diagnosis includes the presence of the closed ankle on the gonioscopy and the raise in the intraocular pressure. However, in the plateau iris, usually the central anterior chamber will remain deep, but this patient has a shallow anterior chamber centrally. And also the presence of the, uh, the absence of the double hum sign on the 
adaptation gonioscopy also doesn't support the diagnosis of the plateau iris syndrome. Plateau iris syndrome usually involves both eye and usually occur in the younger patient, which does not fit into our case. On the gonioscopy, the double hump side actually show a peripheral hump and a central hump. The peripheral hump on the iris is caused by the CRA body propping up the iris root where, uh, and the central pump, the central pump uh, is, a, is represent the central third of the iris resting on the surface of the lens. The third differential diagnosis uh, is a left eye pigmentary glaucoma. The pigmentary glaucoma is a secondary open anchor glaucoma, which characterized by excessive pigment release from the iris pigment epithelium due to the rubbing of the posterior iris epithelium against the lens zonium. The pigment will accumulate in the trabecular meshwork and reduce the aqueous outflow and cause the increase in the intraocular pressure. Usually, the anterior chamber is deep in the pigmentary glaucoma. As you can see, the first picture shows the pigmentary glaucoma, and the second picture shows the cucumber spindle on the cornea endothelium. So the supporting point for this diagnosis is the raise in the intraocular pressure and the presence of the glaucomatous optic disc. However, the pigmentary glaucoma usually happen, uh, usually present in the younger population, but our patient is an elder, elderly patient. Another point against this diagnosis are the presence of the closed ankle on the gonioscopy and the shallow anterior chamber. No cucumber, no cucumber spindles were seen on this patient. After that, we proceed uh, with the investigation. Several investigation was done to support our professional diagnosis. The, investi the investigation can be divided into ocular and systemic investigations. For the ocular investigations, we did the optical biometry with the IOL Master 700. The optical biometry is used to measure the axial length and the lens thickness. It helps to differentiate whether it is a primary or secondary uh, ankle closure glaucoma because usually in the primary ankle closure glaucoma, the patient has a short eyeball with the short axial length. The optical biometry also help uh, to calculate the intraocular lens power for the cataract surgery, let, uh, surgery letter. As you can see, the right eye and the left eye, they both have a normal axial length uh, with, the, uh, with the result 69 millimeter and the 22.67 millimeter. Both uh, are within the normal range. For the right eye, the lens thickness is 4.85 millimeter, which is also within the normal range. But for the left eye, we couldn't get the lens thickness because of the presence of the phacodonesis uh, leads to the poor fixation. The second investigation is the anterior segment optical coherent tomography. Uh, anterior segment OCT is used to measure the anterior chamber depth and also to visualize the anterior chamber angle. From this picture, you can see there is a asymmetrical of the anterior chamber depth and also the anterior chamber angle. The anterior chamber angle is situated between the cornea and the iris. On the right eye, you can see there is an open angle, but for the left eye, you can see there is a closed angle. And for the SC depth, it's usually measured at the center of the anterior uh, chamber. And for the right eye, the anterior chamber depth is 2.34 millimeter. However, the left eye has a shallow anterior chamber depth of 1.62 millimeter. Uh, another investigation is the Humphrey visual field. The Humphrey visual field is a diagnostic test to measure the visual field. In this case, we use the Humphrey visual field 24-2 to measure the central visual field 24 degrees from the fixation point. It used a different light intensity to detect the visual field defect. As you, can, as you can see on the left eye visual field, there is a multiple blackish dot on the left eye, which indicate the uh, area of the visual field defect. And this patient has a tunnel vision, whereby he is only able to see the superior field. And for the right eye, the few, the few blackish dots on the temporal area show that it's a normal blind spot. However, he has a few blackish uh, dots over the inferior, which, uh, which could appear as a germ visual field defect. But because of the high projection loss, this result was not reliable. Even though it is very high, highly suspicious, 
but patient has no glaucomatous optic disc. Therefore, we will close monitor the patient and repeat the visual field on the next appointment. For the systemic investigations, uh, we have taken a few uh, blood tests as a preparation for the cataract surgery. Uh, the full blood count and the renal profile was normal for this patient. And the fasting blood sugar was 4.7 uh, with a HbA1c of 5.8%. It showed that patient has a good diabetic mellitus control and the check x-ray was normal. So for this case, our final diagnosis are left eye ankle closure glaucoma secondary to subluxator lens with underlying pseudo exfoliation syndrome, right eye pseudo exfoliation syndrome, and the both eye grade two hypertensive retinopathy. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Kwanzi. Uh, maybe um, when uh, uh, Dr. Shia is speaking on the slides, uh, will Dr. Mushida just answer a few questions? There is a question from the audience uh, asking what is the normal IOP? Uh, so our normal intraocular pressure will be between 10 to 21. Anything above it is a um, high intraocular pressure, but if it's too low, then uh, if it's below 10, it, then it is too low, then the eyeball will be hypotensive or soft eyeball. Or hypotonic, okay. Or hypotonic, yes. And uh, yeah, the, next the next question, question, question that they ask, ask is actually, what is the significant, what is the, what call it, uh, what, what is, is the double, double hump when you, uh, you told uh, about the, um, the significance of the gonioscopy? What is double hump sign uh, in um, pseudo aspirative? Uh, you mean in plateau iris syndrome? Uh, sorry, in uh, plateau iris syndrome. Okay, so the double hump sign is you can see the sign when we do the gonioscopy. So basically, um, uh, it is seen in the plateau iris uh, syndrome. So in plateau iris syndrome, there is an anterior insertion of the um, iris root. So it causes uh, it has this uh, forward uh, it, the the placement of the iris is abnormal. So when we do the uh, gonioscopy, uh, it will give a peripheral hum and a central hum because of the indentation of the uh, because of the indentation of the gonioscopy lens. So you will get a uh, you see a double hum. In compared to a normal iris, you don't see this uh, double hum sign. Actually, just now when, uh, uh, if you look, uh, can you share the slide please again? And you can actually see the gonioscopy when you look at the gonioscopy. Uh, gonioscopy. Doing a presentation. Okay, um, just a, a slideshow. So you can actually see an open angle. Uh, on the left side is an open uh, angle. You can actually see all the structures of the eye. From the ciliary body down there uh, to the, um, uh, the uh, trabecular meshwork that, that is actually uh, not marked with the pigment. You, uh, can you show the uh, trabecular meshwork? So you can actually, uh, and uh, if you can actually see all those uh, structure, this is open angle. However, uh, if you look at the other side on the right side, uh, there is no angle structure seen. In double hum, uh, you see uh, similar to the closed angle, but when you press the gonioscopy, you can actually see the structures of the eye. So that's why you can actually see a uh, double hum because it's humped. Uh, uh, it's like a, a, a what I call it, a camel. Uh, and when you press the camel's hum, then you can actually see the angles. It's only the insertion of the iris is uh, different in uh, plateau iris. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, let's uh, go on to the next presenter. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Shahira will be presenting uh, in the next uh, pre uh, pre uh, next half, and then when we can actually have uh, questions uh, later.
please ask your questions uh, in the Q&A box. Okay, uh, there is a... There is another question asking, do all patients with glaucoma have high IUP? Uh, glaucoma by definition is uh, changes um, uh, characteristic uh, seen uh, in the um, optic nerve and visual field and IUP is a risk factor. P patients with high IUP uh, but no changes in the visual field or optic disc is called ocular hypertension. So they are not considered glaucoma. But a patient with glaucoma, uh, with definite glaucoma will have high IUP and characteristic optic disc and optic nerve, uh, optic disc and also visual field changes. Hope that will answer your question uh, uh, from the audience. Okay, are you ready, uh, Dr. Shahira? Another question. Okay. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to everyone. Today I will be presenting about pseudo exfoliation syndrome and the association and its related complication to this uh, problem. As the introduction. The pseudo exfoliation syndrome is a complex and age related systemic disorder. It is characterized by the progressive accumulation and granular deposition of abnormal extracellular whitish pseudo exfoliative material in various intraocular and extraocular tissue. Basically, it is a systemic disease. Uh, it is highly related with a pseudo exfoliation glaucoma one of the complications of this condition, and it is as a result of the accumulation of the pseudo mechanical obstruction to the trabecular meshwork, which is a drainage pathway of the aqueous uh, humor, and leading to an increase in IOP levels. The pathophysiology behind this uh, pseudo exfoliation is uh, this material are synthesized intracellular in the anterior segment of uh, the eyes, trabecular endothelial cells, as well as the lens epithelial cells. And then this material is released into the extracellular space and deposited around the cells. And it, pro it also deposited at the other structures, including the zonules which is the suspensory ligament of the lens, the pupillary margin, and the anterior lens surface. The further accumulation of uh, pseudo exfoliative material will uh, alter the metabolism and hence it disturb the structures and the function. There is the condition we call as the true exfoliative syndrome. But then this true exfoliate, exfoliation syndrome is a very rare condition. The difference it is between the true and the pseudo exfoliation syndrome is in the true exfoliation syndrome, it is caused by the repeated exposure to high level of infrared radiation or into the thermal injury, which lead to the epithelial damage to the lens capsule. Further lead to the capsular dehiscence then cause it a frank capsular delamination of the lens. It is in contrast to the pseudo exfoliation. The pseudo exfoliation is the accumulation of an abnormal fibrillous substances which is released by the structures that I mentioned uh, on the first uh, slide.
As I mentioned just now, uh, it is a systemic condition. So there is a systemic association with a pseudo exfoliation syndrome. It is uh, uh, the system that involves mainly uh, at the cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease. It also causes the hypertension and aortic aneurysm. It is due to the at the pericellular accumulation of the pseudo exfoliation. It disturbs the normal structures of the basement membrane, and it leads to the endothelial dysfunction. And uh, it is also associated with the elevated serum homocysteine level and serum oxidative stress uh, uh, in the circulation, such as the MMP, matrix methyloproteins, or increase in the serum antiphospholipid level. This uh, excess uh, level of homocysteine or the oxidative uh, stress uh, level, it is induced the neural cell damage and degradation of the elastic structures in the arterial wall and result in the weakened elasticity and contractility of the vascular wall and increase the vascular resistance that lead, lead to the cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, hypertension, aortic aneurysm. The ocular features of uh, this pseudo exfoliation involve mainly the anterior segment of the eye, which is include the lens, the zonules, iris, trabecular meshwork, as well as the cornea. The classical features of this uh, disease can be seen at the anterior lens capsule where there is a three distinct zone we call as the hoar frost ring sign which shown it is shown that the pseudo exfoliative deposition at the anterior surface of the lens this it has a three different zone the central zone here the intermediate which is the clear zone on the anterior lens capsule and the peripheral zones the clear in intermediate zone is the result from the rubbing of the iris over the anterior lens surface during the pupillary uh, physiological uh, pupillary movement. And uh, other uh, ocular features involve the first is the pseudo exfoliative material at the pupillary margin. The pupil will uh, having a difficulty to dilate because to having a mid-dilated pupil when we try to dilate the eye. There is a presence of peripupillary iris atrophy. The sub, uh, due to the zonul, zonul or suspensory ligament problem, uh, it causing the subluxated cataractus lens. This photo shows the subluxated lens and the visible uh, strand of the zonula dehiscent. And uh, the sum policy line can be seen when we perform gonioscopy. The sum policy line indicate that the melanin deposition at the anterior part of the angle. As I mentioned just now, this uh, disease is highly related to the glaucoma. From uh, according to the Blue Mountain Eye Studies from Australia, it shown that there is a strong association was found between the pseudo exfoliation and the glaucoma. And the glaucoma itself was around eight times as frequent in the eye with pseudo exfoliation than the eye without the pseudo exfoliation. Glaucoma in the pseudo exfoliation can be either open angle or closed angle glaucoma. The open angle glaucoma is a result from the combination local production of pseudo exfoliative material passively deposited pseudo exfoliative material and melanin dispersion during madrasis. This will cause a mechanical blockage and obstruct the outflow of the aqueous humor. While the angle closure glaucoma occur as a result from the zonular instability cause the lens subluxated uh, anteriorly. Apart from that, the, this 
syndrome also associated with the cataract progression. Studies also from the Blue Mountain Eye Studies, it shown that the eye with pseudo exfoliation syndrome had a markedly greater prevalence of cortical cataract and nuclear cataract than the eye without the pseudo exfoliation syn syndrome. This is uh, when they look through the electron microscope, the iris tissue in the eye with the pseudo exfoliation has a deposition of this material uh, adjacent to the vascular endothelial wall of the iris and the basement membrane of the vessel. This causes a reduction in the vessel lumen, subsequently will impair the blood aqueous barrier. And due to the alteration in the iris vasculature and the blood aqueous barrier, it is affect the composition of the aqueous, subsequently affect the less metabolism and lead to cataract formation. For diagnostic investigation of this syndrome, it is uh, clinically diagnosed without invasive method. However, if it is associated with a glaucoma, it requires glaucoma monitoring, such as Humphrey visual field test. For general management of pseudo exfoliation syndrome, mainly it's not require any treatment unless this condition associated with other ocular disease. If it is associated with glaucoma, treatment is required to bring down the IOP to prevent further damage to the optic nerve leading to the optic neuropathy. If a, it is associated with a significant cataract, it's required cataract surgery. So in our case, this patient presented to us with the high intraocular pressure due to the angle closure glaucoma, secondary to subluxated lens. It lead to the pupillary block glaucoma. So the reduction intraocular pressure is mandatory uh, to reduce the intraocular pressure. Uh, we need to give a systemic and a topical anti-glaucoma medication to bring down the intraocular pressure. And then the definitive peripheral area Iridotomy is to release the pupillary block. This peripheral iridotomy, we use the laser device to make a hole at the peripheral iris, like in this photo. Uh, it is create an alternative pathway for the aqueous to outflow. Second management of this patient is the subluxated cataractus gland. Therefore, we proceed the, with the cataract surgery. To do exfoliation is challenging due to poor pupillary dilatation, zonular dialysis, capsular rupture, as well as vitreous loss. This patient underwent the left eye cataract extraction to relieve the causal reason for the angle closure glaucoma, which is the subluxated cataractus gland. Intraoperatively, we found there was a present of extensive uh, zonular laxity, which is more than 270 degree with a vitreous loss. Therefore, because of the full capsular support, we are unable to put the intraocular lens within the capsular uh, bag. From this uh, photo here, I want to demonstrate that the intraocular lens that we inserted is within the capsular bag with a good capsular support and the zone with a good zonal suspension. However, in our case, because of this patient have a full support, we need to schedule for secondary IOL and left this patient FAQ postoperatively. In the case of the poor capsular support, the choice, choice of the secondary intraocular lens include the anterior chamber IOL, sclerofixated IOL, and iris claw IOL. For the first photo, is shown the above first photo is uh, I want to show that the anterior chamber intraocular lens. We insert the lens in front of the iris tissue. For the sclerofixated IOL, this diagram, the middle diagram, I want to show that the scleral 
we describe IOL, describe visit to IOL or the IOL itself, we implant at its original position, which is inside the capsule. However, the haptic here, we need to suture it to make it stable. And for the iris claw IOL, it is similar to the anterior chamber uh, intraocular lens. We implanted it in front of the iris tissue. However, we need to clip the haptic. Sorry. We need to clip the haptic, uh, the, the iris to the haptic. This video, I want to show how we perform the reverse pupillary iris claw insertion for this patient. First, we give an adequate subtenone anesthesia to the operated eye and form the towel periotomy as well as the limbal corneal incision to ease the IOL insertion letter. The remnant of the cortical matter of the lens, uh, we clean it with the ultimate we manually pull the minus the iris by using a forcep and enlarge the cornea wall. Now the we insert the iris claw. IOL into the anterior chamber in front of the iris. Then we position it horizontally. We use a special forcep to hold the iris and to push it behind the iris to make sure that the lens is not fall at the back. We need to stabilize first the lens before we keep the haptic to the iris tissue. Now, we use a second instrument to clip the iris tissue to the head. Now we can see a smiley shape of the pupil, which is indicate that the iris is already clipped inside the haptics and we suture back the cornea wound. This is the photo showing the iris claw IOM. The first, the first photo here, it is show the AC fit, anterior chamber fixation of the lens. And this is the retropupillary fixation. In our case, we do a retropupillary fixation of the iris claw lens. And progression for this patient, during the AFK uh, period, when we not implanted the lens, the vision was 60, 60 which is a quite bad vision. However, after we implant the secondary IOL implantation, the left eye best corrected vision improved to 6-9 vision and this patient happy with his current vision. For the long-term plan of this patient, he has to be followed up lifelong due to the glaucoma and monitor the progression of the glaucoma. We need to control the intraocular pressure with the topical anti-glaucoma and plan for the cataract surgery on the right eye if it is significant. Take home message from this presentation Glaucoma is the silent thief of the sight. Even the cataract can cause irreversible blindness if it is associated with a chronic eye disease 
and timely diagnosis is needed to prevent blindness. That's all from us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shahina. Okay. So, uh, we will proceed with a of uh, questions uh, to answer. So, maybe we'll proceed uh, straight to the question and answer. Okay. Are the panelists ready for the question and answer? Um, okay. There's one question asking, do angle closure glaucoma always present uh, with pain and redness of the red of the eye associated with headache and vomiting. Uh, Dr. Mujuda, maybe you can actually take that question. Um, uh, yes, uh, usually uh, in acute angle closure, patient usually present with uh, pain, uh, eye redness and uh, blurring of vision. Uh, because the most common cause of acute angle closure is a pupillary block. However, uh, some patients uh, who has a chronic angle closure, uh, they can have a similar uh, symptom such as in open angle closure where they don't have pain. And in this case, uh, actually the angle closure uh, in this case is because of there is a subluxated lens whereby the lens already has been shifted forward. So um, we think that maybe the lens uh, at times uh, do um, cause uh, intermittent um, angle closure uh, and it may be a long standing whereby uh, it's a chronic uh, angle closure so patient has no pain during presentation. You can um, also actually see um, that the um, cornea is clear. Uh, do, do acute angle closure present at, with clear cornea actually? Because the patient have a uh, good vision and the uh, IUP is 54 millimeter mercury, which is very high. So that is that usual for acute angle closure glaucoma? Um, it's not usual because um, if the intraocular pressure is very high, uh, for instance, uh, above 50, or us, uh, there will be presence of corneal edema and patient uh, will have a hazy cornea and complain of blurring of vision. Vision, okay. Sorry. Um, they, uh, well, um, to answer that question, patient well, uh, chronic, uh, well, uh, angle closure glaucoma, there are two types. One is the chronic type, one, one, one more is the uh, acute type. The acute type will present with acutely with pain and redness of the eye. But the chronic type is similar with open angle glaucoma. So they have, don't have any symptoms, but when you actually measure their, or look at the gonoscopy and you see the angles are narrow. So um, they can have a pressure of 60, 50, 60, but, uh, but the cornea is clear and the vision is retained, but the vision, the visual field, as you see in the patient, uh, is um, uh, constricted, similar to open angle uh, glaucoma. So uh, even though with subluxated sub lens, it's usually an acute a stage, they have acute angle closure glaucoma, but in this stage, it probably, as uh, Dr. Mishida said, it causes uh, intermittent uh, uh, angle closure glaucoma. So the patient is actually as similar as the chronic angle closure. Okay, so, uh, and uh, is the, uh, there's a question asking, what is the, what, uh, is there a uh, sublacated lens is similar to phacodonesis? What, what do you, so, um, phacodonesis is uh, a sign in a subluxated lens, uh, usually caused by uh, laxity of the zonules. So, the zonules uh, is actually holding the lens. So, when, when there is laxity or dehiscence of the zonules, so the, there will be phacodonesis and examples are subluxated lens. And causes for subluxated lens can be multiple, such as one of it can be a trauma. In this case, it's a pseudo-exfoliative uh, syndrome. 
causing laxity uh, of the zonus. Okay, thank you. Maybe the next uh, uh, question can be answered by Dr. Kwan Zee. Uh, uh, well, this is, uh, I think probably either Dr. Mercida or Dr. Kwan Zee to uh, uh, answer this. Is it possible uh, uh, that dry eyes can get glaucoma? What do you think? Um, the dry eyes doesn't cause the glaucoma and uh, the dry eye is not a risk factor to have the glaucoma. But the patient with the glaucoma, uh, when the patient is only on any on multiple topical eye drops, it can cause the dryness of the eyes because of the preservative um, content inside the topical anti-glaucoma. Okay. Um, uh, next question is, uh, is, do you have to do comfy visual feel in patients with acute angle closure glaucoma? Uh, for the acute setting in the acute angle closure glaucoma, the comfy visual feel is not necessary on the immediate setting. Um, when the patient having the acute angle closure glaucoma, the immediate management is to bring down the intraocular pressure by giving the topical anti-glaucoma anti and systemic anti-glaucoma. And the time patient is having eye pain, eye redness, nausea, head headache, and vomiting, and patient will not be cooperative for the hungry visual field. And the result will not be reliable uh, at, uh, when, if we do the hungry visual field in the acute setting. But, but in, this, in this patient, we actually did hungry visual field, right? Actually. Yeah, yeah this patient, patient, although having a, a close angle, uh, close angle, Secondary close in, uh, secondary close angle glaucoma, but patient is comfortable. He has no eye pain, no eye redness, no headache, no nausea, and vomiting, and he is cooperative to do the humble visual feel at that time. We uh, have a few more minutes to um, actually answer the question. We have a, a few more. Uh, maybe um, Dr. Shahira can actually answer this question. Um, is there any uh, test or investigation to detect poor capsular support preoperatively? Uh, as uh, mentioned by a few uh, panelists here, uh, before, the poor capsular support uh, is as a result from the uh, zonulopathy as well. So, a uh, patient can having a uh, ocular manifestation uh, with a poor capsular support. Sometimes uh, we can see uh, from the clinical examination, there is a uh, wrinkling of the uh, capsules uh, that cover the lens. Uh, however, for the investigation itself, I'm, uh, I don't think there is a specific investigation uh, that can be uh, performed to the patient because clinically we also can see the, uh, the problem of the capsule, capsular instability. Uh Probably we have one last question. Uh, one last question is, um, how do you follow a um, patient, glaucoma patient actually? Because they have uh, uh, treatment. The glaucoma patient is usually uh, affect the intraocular pressure as well as the visual field loss. So during the follow-up, we need to measure the intraocular pressure of the patient as well as we need to perform a Humphrey visual field to see that if there is any progression of the visual field loss. Because if there is an evidence of high intraocular pressure or evidence of the visual field loss, we need to suspect that this patient might have um, progression in terms of uh, progression of the glaucoma itself. So uh, we need probably need to step up the treatment for the patient.
Okay, I think uh, it, it is, uh, this is the time, we, only time we have today. <laughs> there are a few more questions that we haven't answered, but we will try uh, the best as we can to type the answer and, uh, um, and uh, give you uh, the best uh, answer that we can give actually. And um, we enjoyed the session, I think, um, uh, uh, and hopefully we can thank the presenter with the usual way and I hope to see you in your next uh, webinar. For those uh, who are joining the Facebook Live or YouTube, don't, fill up the, uh, don't forget to fill up the attendance sheet at the end of the webinar. And who, uh, but those who join by Zoom is automatically recorded by the timestamp Zoom. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining um, webinar, this webinar. Uh, goodbye. Okay, terima kasih uh, Prof. Jumaima, Jabatan Oftalmologi, uh, Oftalmologi dan juga panelis. Terima kasih. Uh, dengan ini juga saya sharekan uh, webinar yang akan datang, Bicara Emas Fakulti uh. Perubatan UKM, sempena sambutan jubli emas UKM bertajuk mem Memacu UKM ke arah menjadi universiti tersohor di pesada dunia yang akan menampilkan yang membahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Profesor Emerita Dr. Sharifah Hafsah Syed Hassan Syahabuddin yang tak perlu diperkenalkan lagi beliau ialah mantan NAP Chancellor UKM yang akan dibantu oleh uh, moderator yang membahagia Profesor Dr. Zarina Datuk Haji Abdul Latif Kimalan Dekan Siswazah Fakulti Perubatan UKM Okey dengan ini saya akan tamatkan siaran Wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.